The year is 1934. Charles B. Darrow of Germantown, Pennsylvania presented a game called Monopoly to the executives of Parker Brothers. Mr. Darrow, like many other Americans, was unemployed at the time and often played this game to amuse himself and pass the time. It was the game's exciting promise of fame and fortune that initially prompted Darrow to produce this game on his own. At least, that is the story Parker Brothers needs you to believe, and it's why they printed it into every Monopoly rulebook. But what if I tell you that actually, this is not how Monopoly was invented, and Parker Brothers were painfully aware of it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the rather ironic story behind one of the most popular board games in human history. Monopoly is an economics themed board game in which players roll dice in order to move around the game board. Players buy and trade properties and develop them with houses and hotels in order to collect more and more rent from their opponents, with the goal of driving them into bankruptcy. Players receive money every time they pass go and can end up in jail if they draw the wrong chance of community cards or if they land on the square which says go to jail. Much like in the real world, you start off dreading the concept of spending time in jail, but as life goes on, the concept of not having to worry about bills makes it worryingly appealing. Two flat-out lies about the real world are perpetuated in the game, free parking in the inner city and bank errors happening in your favor. As such, you could say it's a work of fiction and basically D&D for accountants. Nothing better than some railroads and uh, bankruptcy. Third edition. The little old man on the cover of the games is Mr. Monopoly, who is modeled after business magnate JP Morgan Jr. Contrary to popular belief, he does not, and has never in the past, worn a monocle. Let that one sink in, Mr. Mandela. It has been hypothesized that there are more versions of the game Monopoly than observable stars in the universe. One version has, I, I kid you not, been purposefully made for US prisoners of war in Germany. It included escape maps, compasses, files, and real money. Yeah, POWs escaped from Germany because of Monopoly. I mean, talk about a literal get out of jail free card. The game is nowadays owned by Hasbro, but it was first published by Parker Brothers in 1935. However, that is not where the story of Monopoly begins. Lizzie McGee The actual story begins around 1900 with Elizabeth or Lizzie McGee. She works as a stenographer, and in her free time, she invents a game called The Landlord's Game. It is supposed to be an educational tool in order to illustrate the evils of capitalism and to promote another economic system instead. You wanna guess which one it is? A. Socialism B. Socialism 2 Electric Boogaloo C. Georgism D. Communism and I know what you might think, but it is actually Georgism. Georgism is an economic theory based on the teachings of Henry George. You see, around the late 19th century, there was a lot of poverty in the cities, and Henry George claimed that there are mainly two factors that are to blame. Land ownership, so a handful of rich people owning most of the land, and monopolies, a handful of companies owning most of the industry. In order to combat that, Henry George's idea was to get rid of all of the taxes so that poor people get to keep more of their income, except for property tax. If you have land, you can't really own it, just rent it and pay taxes depending on how big it is. His idea was so popular at the time that his book Progress and Poverty was the second most popular book after the lesser known New York Times bestseller, The Bible. For every person that didn't own land, which was most of the people, that sounded like a great idea. I don't pay taxes, but rich people do instead. For rich people, that sounded like a terrible idea. I pay taxes. And so it never caught on. Henry George died in 1897, but Lizzie McGee wanted to keep spreading the good word of George's single tax theory in a way that was easily understandable for the common people as well as children. So she came up with the hyper-competitive, family-disrupting board game called The Landlord's Game which she patents in 1904. For those of you who are skeptical as to whether this is actually the origin of Monopoly or just some game that is similar by coincidence, let me tell you about the Landlord's Game. Rather than going from start to finish, 
the players go in circles around a square-shaped board, which is actually pretty innovative for the time. There are four railroad squares in the middle of each side of the board. You get money from the bank every time you pass start. It has a go-to-jail square, which actually has an explanation in this version. You don't go because you play in a higher difficulty in the South Park game, but because you're trespassing on British Lord Blueblood's property. After the go to jail square, you'll be surprised to hear that it also has a jail. Furthermore, you have the electric company, which, to be fair, is a square further and is called Light Franchise. And you have the uh, waterworks, which also is displaced by one square and called the Water Franchise, so this is uh, it's completely different. If you take into account that most of the other squares are properties, then I think this is the part where you tell your teacher that you didn't copy your best friend's homework, it's just that great minds think alike. In my humble opinion, it's fair to assert that some inspiration for Monopoly has been taken from the Landlord's game. And with some, I basically mean all. Another interesting part of the story is how Lizzie planned on using this game to teach about Georgism. For that, I'll take a quick minute to explain the outcome of every Monopoly game ever played. So Monopoly is a game where people acquire properties with money, develop them, and other players that land on that property have to pay rent to the owner. And so what happens in the end of each Monopoly game is that there's going to be a winner that has all of the money and owns all of the property. There's usually one person that insists on scouring the rulebook for an interpretation of the rules that they swear they played with their grandma once and which happens to be favorable to them. And the rest of the players are either broke, in jail, or they have stolen enough money from the bank throughout the game that they're still in it for the power trip of the eventual winner to drag on for around 20 more minutes. All in all, there's usually one winner that takes it all, and a lot of also rounds who have absolutely nothing. Uh, and the same basically applied in Lizzie McGee's Landlord's Game. While it is easy to see how this was meant to criticize the disparities present in free-range capitalism, it still begs the question how this was supposed to promote Georgism in particular. You see, the interesting thing about the Landlord's game was that it was explicitly intended to be played in two different ways. The first way of playing was called the Monopoly variant, the one we basically still play today, and the second way was called the Single Tax variant. This way of playing was very similar to the Monopoly variant with the exception of one rule. Anytime you land on a property that belonged to another player, instead of giving money to that player, the money is shared with all of the other players. This was meant to simulate the property tax that the player owning the property would have to pay, which would go to all of the other people. First you were meant to play the Monopoly variant and see how bad everything goes to heck, and then you were meant to play the single tax variant and see how the harmony brought upon the players makes families reconnect, makes Uncle Joe forget about his alcoholism and aspiring Austrian painters be accepted into art school. However, unfortunately for them, and McGee, none of that would really materialize as one of the versions of the game would basically be forgotten about over the course of the following years. Guess which one? The, the one where everything is super nice and happy and puppies and kittens and everybody wins, or the one where everything is super competitive and families and friendships go to die a gruesome death? Yeah, sorry little puppies and kittens, you have landed on my boardwalk hotel and owe me two and a half souls. After McGee filed the 1904 patent, the company Economic Games did distribute the Landlord's game and it became fairly popular in various different places in the United States. However, what the people did was they simply took the game's rules and drew their own game boards and crafted their own game pieces. To the point where most people didn't even know where the game originally came from, or that it was called the Landlord's game. For many people, the game was simply known under the name of the variant they always played. Monopoly. Lizzie McGee renews the patent in 1924 and includes a couple of familiar changes to the game. She includes streets, which are grouped together based on their color, the lovely income tax square, which, dare I say, quite excessively takes 100% of your wage, and the luxury tax. The game also becomes a big hit in colleges, most of the time on self-made game boards, which the college students already call Monopoly. Over the colleges, the game reaches the Quaker community located in a city that at that time became a booming holiday destination. Atlantic City. 
Quakers met up a lot and they love themselves some board games. What they really like to do is take some of the popular games and make mods and expansions for them, which they of course also did for the Landlords game. They were the ones who changed the community park to free parking and they added the chance and community chess cards. The Quakers also weren't a big fan of auctions and so they gave all of the streets fixed prices, as well as changing the street names to the ones you find in Atlantic City. And this is where the streets actually are. The purple Mediterranean and Baltic Avenue used to be fairly poor neighborhoods, hence why they are the least expensive ones on the board. In newer versions of Monopoly, the purple streets are actually brown. In the east of the city we find the light blue streets, Oriental, Vermont and Connecticut Avenue. The pink streets are right next to them, with States and Virginia Avenues and St. Charles Place, which actually does not exist anymore because somebody built a hotel on it. A street featured in Monopoly does not exist anymore because somebody built a hotel on it. Perfect. The part of the town where the orange streets are was mostly populated by the Irish. It encompasses St. James Place, Tennessee and New York Avenue. If you want to win in Monopoly, that's the color you want to get. Further west you have the red streets with Kentucky, Indiana and Illinois Avenue, latter of which has been renamed Martin Luther King Boulevard. Atlantic Avenue is the longest street in the game. It goes across the whole of Absecon Island, on which Atlantic City is the northeastern half. Venn Avenue runs parallel to that in the opposite direction, and located on it you'll find a little park called Marvin Gardens. Going back up northeast, you will find the green streets of Pacific Avenue, where most of the casinos are, as well as North Carolina and Pennsylvania Avenue, which, given how expensive they are in the game, are surprisingly unremarkable. The most expensive properties in the game are the dark blue ones. Park Place used to be a nice little park next to the waterfront, but also doesn't exist anymore because somebody built a hotel there. And perhaps the most famous board game space in history is, of course, the Boardwalk a wooden pedestrian walkway along the beach of Atlantic City, and one of the first of its kind. These were the streets the Quakers chose for their variant of Monopoly, which was now basically the same game that we know today. One of those Quakers was Charles Todd, and on one fateful day he ran into a woman he knew from back in Quaker school by the name of Esther Jones. Esther invites Todd over for dinner with her family. Todd gladly accepts and says, boy have I got a game for you. What Todd didn't know at the time is that Esther Jones happened to be the wife of the person whose name you'll now find in every Monopoly manual, Charles B. Darrow. And so in 1934, a couple of people came together for the most important game of Monopoly ever played. Although everybody was a little shocked over the calculated sadism that five-year-old Sarah Darrow showed as she financially obliterated Todd and her parents, the evening was a great success. So much so that Charles Darrow asked Todd whether he could give him the rules of the game in writing so that Darrow could play it with his family and friends in the coming weeks. Todd is a little suspicious of the request at first, but writes the rules down anyways. Charles B. Darrow. Given what you know about the success of the game and who's credited with it, you may now think rather ill of Charles Darrow. However, Charles Darrow and his family were poor. The depression hit them hard and he had a very ill son for whom Charles could barely afford medical treatment anymore. So his idea was to distribute this version of the game Monopoly for profit in his community in order to help pay some of the bills. We know that Darrow copied this Quaker version of the game that Todd wrote down for him because he not only copied all of the street names and locations, but also one of the typos that Todd made when he wrote down the rules for Darrow. A typo that is in the game to this day, Marvin Gardens, which should actually be Marven Gardens, whoops. And so as mentioned in the beginning, the game becomes very popular and Darrow goes to Parker Brothers who tell him that they don't want the game. Because yeah, well, it's too complicated, takes too long and frankly, amidst an economic depression, who wants to play a game about buying a lot of property where most players end up poor? Fair enough, but absolutely wrong. Robert Barton takes over the company Parker Brothers in 1934. His wife tells him about this game Monopoly. He approaches Darrow in 1935 and offers to buy the game for $7,000 and parts of the profit. Darrow obviously agrees and in 1936 they sold 35,000 copies of the game every week. Darrow and his family soon became millionaires and Parker Brothers made a fortune. However, they had one big problem. A problem that started with L and ended with Andlot's game. 
Legal Consequences Parker Brothers were founded in the 1880s, and they had a rather unusual approach to the distribution of games that made them very successful financially. Rather than coming up with their own game ideas, they buy the rights to smaller companies and people's intellectual properties and distribute those under their brand. They would even just buy the rights to sports. One of the sports they had the rights to was ping pong. Yeah, ping pong or table tennis was owned by Parker Brothers. I mean, anyone was obviously allowed to play ping pong, but Parker Brothers were the only ones allowed to sell any of the ping pong equipment. I mean, imagine that today, like Bethesda's golf. So for the longest time, ping pong was basically the brand name, whereas the activity was called table tennis. Or at least that is what the companies want you to say, because if a term is so commonly used that it becomes synonymous with the activity itself, the company loses the trademark on that term. Another example of that is people calling it riding the escalator, rather than motor-driven chain of individually linked steps on a track which cycle in a pair of tracks which keep them horizontal. Or moving stairs. Is why the Otis Elevator Company lost the trademark on the term escalator. And people calling it playing ping pong rather than table tennis is why Parker Brothers lost the trademark on ping pong. And it is why Google wants you to say you searched for something on Google rather than you googled something, because otherwise they might lose their trademark as well. Bing, on the other hand, wants you to say just Bing it because children in hell are closer to getting a day off school because of heavy snowfall rather than binging something becoming the predominant expression for looking something up on the internet anytime soon. The fiasco that was the colloquialization of the term ping pong is something Parker Brothers definitely wanted to prevent from Monopoly, which was especially difficult given that the game they wanted to release as their own was already widely known as Monopoly. Back then, the idea that Parker Brothers would just buy the rights to Monopoly and distribute it as their game that they came up with was absurd given that the Landlord's game existed and that there were so many people that made their own bootleg versions of it that they called Monopoly. To understand how insane that is and why nobody did it before, imagine a massive game company today coming out and saying, uh, hey people, we've got this hot new game that we're gonna release around Christmas in 2021. You should check it out and buy it from us and nobody can make it anymore because we came up with it. Uh, what's it called? Chess. In order to make sure that they were not sued by others, Parker Brothers asked Darrow to write down how exactly he came up with the idea of this game and what inspired him. Darrow had a long hard think and after he wrestled with his conscience for a couple of days, he wrote that Monopoly was actually indeed 100% his idea and that he used Atlantic City for the street names even though he didn't live there because he went there on vacation once with his family and found it to be rather nice and since he was poor they couldn't go again but he wanted to be able to take his family anyways. Oh, that was of course a lie, but the story was believable and coherent enough for Parker Brothers and their legal purposes. Because of plausible deniability, they sure as heck didn't acquire further. Instead, the story became part of their marketing strategy for the game, as you had the best racks to riches American dream story you could ever imagine. Which is why they started to print it in all of their manuals. On top of that, Parker Brothers knew that there were a lot of similar games and effectively clones of Monopoly already on the market and so they simply bought the rights to all of these games as well. But what about Liz McGee? Parker Brothers could of course see that there were some... How do I put this? Similarities between the two games and approached McGee with an offer to buy the rights off of her. We would like the patent. No. Please. No. Okay, how about we get the patent, but we also distribute the Landlord's game as one of ours, and we're gonna print your face on the cover, and you get part of the profit, and $500. Lizzie agreed to the terms and was absolutely thrilled. Until she wasn't. Because only a year later, her Landlord's game is taken off the market because it just doesn't sell. Lizzie was of course terribly disappointed by that. However, what was actually worse for her was that Monopoly quite ironically became a shining symbol for what she wanted to criticize. In her words, it had become representative of what was good about America and actually a positive symbol of capitalism. Anti-Monopoly. In 1973, economist and professor Rolf Ansbach wanted to make a game called Anti-Monopoly. Because he said that the regular Monopoly does promote getting rich through a Monopoly, which is illegal. 
The judges were not impressed by that argument, however he made the case that Parker Brothers and Darrow weren't actually the inventor of Monopoly, and over a court case that took more than 10 years, he managed to piece together the detailed history of Monopoly, from the landlord's game of the Quakers to Charles Darrow. That's how we know about this story today. He won the case, and Anti-Monopoly was printed. During the court case, he famously remarked that Parker Brothers had taken something that was in the public domain and went hippity hoppity, let's make it a monopoly. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much to my loyal Patreons. Thank you also to my new Patreons, Travis Cast, Rene Henrich, Web Raider, Howard Zhang, Rob K, Quincy from FreeCodeCamp.org, Alex, John P, David and Henry. Thank you very much. If you want your name to be next in the credits of all of my channel's videos forever, subscribe to my Patreon before somebody else does it. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Have a lovely day. While Lizzie McGee had made peace with herself in the situation, to this day visitors of the Greenwood Cemetery in New York have to leave their phone and credit cards at the entrance. Because of the electromagnetic field created by Henry George spinning violently in his grave.